Good morning. My name is Corey Arnold, and I'm the Minister of Youth here at Grace Bible Fellowship Church. I have a few announcements to share with you. This week, we will continue with our fireside chats on Tuesdays and Fridays. On Tuesday this week, we have an interview with Pastor Dan Williams about prayer. And then on Friday, Pastor Ron will continue in his series on the Beatitudes. Wednesdays, we will continue with the virtual prayer meeting and the TSE virtual meeting as well. If you have any questions about upcoming events or would like to talk to a pastor, please call the church office. Allow this to be a reminder to remove any distractions so we can worship our great God. Our call to worship this morning is Psalm 118, verses 1 through 4. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. Let Israel say, his steadfast love endures forever. Let the house of Aaron say, his steadfast love endures forever. Let those who fear the Lord say, his steadfast love endures forever. Let's pray. Gracious and heavenly Father, we just thank you so much that we can worship you, a God whose steadfast love endures forever. Lord, you, you remain the same yesterday, today, and forever. Allow us to always keep that in mind. Allow us to be humble in our worship. Lord, allow us to bow before the throne, to hear from your word, and to grow closer to you, Lord Jesus. Allow our worship to be acceptable to you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Good morning. I'm the assistant pastor, Tim Radcliffe. Would you open your Bibles to Acts chapter 1? Our scripture reading will be uh, the, the, the text of this morning's sermon. We'll be reading Acts chapter 1, verses 1 through 11. Would you follow along with me as I read? In the first book, O Theophilus, I have dealt with all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day when he was taken up, after he had given commands through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen. He presented himself alive to them after his suffering by many proofs, appearing to them during 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. And while staying with them, he ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you have heard from me. For John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So when they had come together, he asked, they asked him, Lord, Will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, It is not for you to know times or seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And when he had said these things as they were looking on, he was lifted up and a cloud took him out of their sight. And while they were gazing into heaven as he went, behold, two men stood by them in white robes. And they said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? This Jesus, who was taken up from you into heaven, will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we come before you this morning, and our hearts are, are filled with thankfulness. We think of what was read in our call to worship, that your steadfast love endures forever. We think of what we have just read, of, of the coming of the Holy Spirit, that, that you have promised to give your spirit to your people. And we are so thankful as we think about the love that you have poured out on us in Christ and the love that you have poured out on us in giving us your spirit. Lord, you have given us so many good and wonderful blessings. So many things that, that at times maybe we forget that you have done for us. And so we pause now to, to think about your love, to think about your mercy and grace, to think about those blessings which you have lavished on us. And as we think, we, we are amazed that the God of the universe, the one who is all-powerful, the one who holds everything in his hand, he loves us and has sent his son to die for us. Lord, we are so thankful for this. At the same time, Lord, we, 
we look around at our circumstances and it could be easy for us to be distracted. Lord, we are so weak and we are so frail. We can see that now. We see how humanity can be so affected by this sickness. We see that there is not much time that we have here on earth, that our lives are, are very fleeting, that we are but a vapor. And Lord, as we look around and, and as we see sickness and loved ones and friends who have been sick and those who have even died, Lord, it, it brings fear. It brings worry and, and discouragement. We pray that you would that you would come and show yourself to us in a way that we will understand. We thank you so much for your word where you have revealed yourself to us and, and you have promised that you are the God of all comfort. And so we pray, Lord, that you would bring comfort to those who are hurting. We know that there are many, even in our church family, who are suffering during this time. The suffering is not limited to our friends and family, but we see it throughout the world. We know that every life has been affected by this disease. And Lord, we, we know that, as, as we've said, it can be discouraging, but we pray that you would give us great hope because the hope of the gospel is that for those who, who trust in you, your son will return the same way as he went, and that when he does, he will receive us into glory, and that we will be with you forever. Lord, we look forward to that day. That is our great hope, a future with you where there is no more sickness, where there is no more pain, no more suffering, and no more sin. Father, as we look forward to that day, we pray that you would keep us strong in our faith, that we would not be those who shrink back, but those who have confidence that you have saved us. Lord, would that affect not only our confidence, but would that come, come out in our words and in our actions, that we would come and, and we would be the hope of this world, the light to this world, that we would shine forth because we know that there is a day that is coming when we will be with you. We pray, Lord, that we would not keep that to ourselves, but that we would share it with those who are suffering, that we would share the gospel with those who are in need. And we pray that you would do a mighty work through this church and through this time. We pray all of these things in the precious name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Good morning, my dear brothers and sisters in Christ. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, you are our God and we are your children. We need to hear from you this morning. We live in a world that is without hope and we have the hope of the gospel, but we need to hear from you this morning. So open our ears, open our minds, open our eyes to your word, how precious it is that we do not have a God who is silent, but has spoken through your word Open our eyes to it. Speak to us, Lord, we pray, through your holy and inerrant word. This we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. I know that Pastor Tim has already read for us from the first chapter of Acts. I invite you to turn there. Our text for this morning is Acts 1, verses 6 through 11. It never hurts to reread the word. So let's read it again together. Acts 1, 6 through 11. So when they had come together, they asked him, that is Jesus, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, it is not for you to know times or seasons that the Father is fixed by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. And when he had said these things, as they were looking on, he was lifted up, and a cloud took him out of their sight. And while they were gazing into heaven as he went, behold, two men stood by them in white robes and said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? This Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven 
will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. May is a month that is filled with holidays. Last Sunday was Mother's Day. Memorial Day is only eight days away. If you have a looser standard on what you consider to be a holiday, yesterday was also Armed Forces Day. May 1st was May Day. For those who like to proclaim their allegiance to culture, but I, I suspect that they're really just more interested in a good party, there's Cinco de Mayo on May the 5th. And if you really want to go to the loosest possible definition of what the word holiday means, May 4th is Star Wars Day, May 5th is National Hoagie Day, and May 6th is my personal favorite, International No Diet Day, which I think should be elevated to national holiday status. But in the purest sense of the word holiday, that is holy day, this Thursday, May the 21st, is one of the most neglected special days on the Christian calendar. It's neglected even by most Christians. That's especially sad because Thursday, we commemorate an important day in the earthly ministry of our Lord Jesus Christ. Give up? Thursday's Ascension Day. And in God's perfect timing, I'm not that smart. I couldn't put this together myself. In God's perfect timing, this is where we are in our study of Acts. After Jesus rose from the dead, the New Testament writers tell us that he appeared to his disciples and to others over the span of 40 days. And then he ascended into heaven. Now that's what we began to look at last week. We're focusing on the permanent prevailing church through a study of Acts 1 and 2. Jesus Christ is building his church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Many have, over the centuries, predicted the failure and even the extinction of the church. But when they do so, they have to reckon with Jesus himself, for the church belongs to Christ, and he guides and protects it. And so our mission not just here at Grace Church, but the universal church that meets throughout the world and across the generations. Our mission is not to keep the church alive, but to keep aligning ourselves as a church with the mission that Jesus has given to his church, a mission that we see in the text I've just read for you. Now, last week we looked at Luke's purpose for writing this sequel to his gospel. He wrote Acts to describe for us the continuing work of Jesus. Luke, the gospel, was all about all that Jesus began to do and to teach, and then our Lord was taken up to glory. Now, Acts is about the work that Jesus continues to do through his spirit and by his church, and we at Grace Church get to participate in that. We get to share in it. We're a very small part of it, maybe just even a little speck. But we're a people on a mission. We are here in Quakertown and in surrounding communities to work to carry out Christ's mission. It's not our mission. It's Christ's church and his mission. And we have the privilege of serving as his emissaries. This morning, we come to a, the dividing line, the ascension of our Lord Jesus Christ. Remember, Acts 1, 1 and 2 says that Luke wrote his gospel to Theophilus, and he wrote it about all that Jesus began to do and to teach until the day when he was taken up. Luke's gospel ends with the ascension, and Acts, in a sense, begins with the ascension. And after opening the letter with a review, a brief review of Jesus' earthly ministry, now we actually come to his departure. But as we see here, our Lord didn't just leave his church to itself. Here, Jesus gives the church its marching orders, but he also provides the church with power so that it can accomplish the mission that Jesus has assigned to it, to us. The account of Jesus' ascension here in Acts begins with a question asked by the apostles a question that reveals an ongoing misunderstanding they had about the nature of the kingdom of God. Well, Jesus responds to their question and then he ascends into heaven. In some ways, this is a very simple and straightforward account, but over the course of the account that Luke gives us, he also provides for us three facts that fuel the church as we seek to be what Jesus has called us to be. Fact number one, Jesus has empowered his church through the gift of the Holy Spirit. 
As we see here, Jesus has told his disciples to remain in Jerusalem until they're given what he describes as the promise of the Father, which verse 5 says involves a, a giving or a baptism by the Holy Spirit. So the disciples, who from this point are known as the apostles, are sent out ones, they're in Jerusalem, and they've been having encounters with the risen Jesus, and now the 40 days have come to an end as we come to verse 6. So when they'd come together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? Now the disciples have been with Jesus for how long? Three years. For three years, Jesus has taught them with great patience about what the kingdom would look like and how it's like every other earthly kingdom. Then Jesus is raised from the dead, and how much more time does he spend with them? Forty more days. According to verse 3, during these 40 days, what's he doing? He's speaking about the kingdom of God. So after spending three years devoting the teaching of his disciples about the nature of his kingdom, Jesus gives them another 40-day refresher course. And yet it is quite clear from what we see in verse 6 that they still do not get it. John Calvin said that there are as many errors as words in their sentence. When it comes to the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom in which Jesus Christ is king, they have, they have misfired on the where question and they've misfired on the when question and they've also misfired on what kind of kingdom is it question. Other than that, they're pretty much right on target. The fact that they ask about restoring the kingdom to Israel tells us that they are thinking political and they're thinking geographical. To restore, that's a key word. To restore is to return to former glory. Now, when was that? When Israel was an independent nation in the days of great King David and wise King Solomon. And the apostles are basically asking Jesus, can we get back to that? And if that were to happen, what would that mean to them personally? Well, Rome would be gone. Jesus would sit on an earthly throne and the apostles would probably be in positions of great prominence and authority as emissaries of the king of kings. And they want this to happen now, at this time. Now, how does Jesus answer their questions? Well, get this. It is not for you to know times or seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority. You know, if you want to guarantee that your book will be a bestseller, just try picking a date for Jesus to return. You can build quite a following, as Harold Camping did. Remember him? He originally wrote that Jesus would return on September the 6th, 1994. That didn't happen. He later said the world would end in October 2011. By the way, we're still here. As one of Camping's end of the world dates approached, knowing that he'd been wrong before, atheists in Tacoma, Washington planned a, and I quote, countdown to backpedaling day. They wanted to celebrate it. And Christians all over the world, who are always open to hostility from unbelievers, were mocked again. So hear what Jesus is saying. He's saying that we shouldn't be devoting most of our time to trying to figure out dates and timelines for future events. Those things are not for us to know. Try reading Deuteronomy 29, 29, if you've got that inclination for God says the secret things belong to the Lord our God, but the things that are revealed belong to us and to our children forever. Joseph Piper gives this advice. We must be constantly reminded that we are to go as far as scripture lets us go, but we, we must discipline ourselves not to go beyond scripture. So the disciples, they have this misconception that the kingdom of Jesus is an earthly kingdom based in Jerusalem, and the Lord has returned from the grave to establish it. And Jesus oh so gently corrects them. I, I love the gentleness of our Lord. He basically says, you know, my friends, brothers and sisters, you need to stop thinking that way because your thinking is far too small. The church that Jesus is building is a worldwide kingdom and a spiritual kingdom, not a localized kingdom and a political kingdom. Having corrected their thinking, Jesus in verse 8 provides our mission as the church of Jesus Christ. It is our marching orders. 
but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. The mission is to bear witness to Jesus. The mission is to testify to his glorious gospel, to his death and resurrection, to testify to the salvation that he alone offers through repentance and faith. You will be my witnesses. It's a statement of fact from a sovereign Lord. And note the width and the breadth of it. The, the apostles envisioned a kingdom anchored in Jerusalem. And Jesus starts with Jerusalem, but that's just a starting point and a springboard. It is not an end in itself. I love that verse 8 is basically an outline of the whole book of Acts. Acts 1 through 7, the first seven chapters, they take place in Jerusalem. Starting, though, in Acts 8, persecution leads to the scattering of the apostles, but they take the gospel with them. And where do they go? To Judea and Samaria. The gospel bears fruit in Judea and Samaria, and that continues through Acts 12. And then we get to Acts 13. And starting with Acts 13, Paul and Barnabas and later Paul and Silas, they go on missionary journeys. They take the good news of Jesus Christ to the end of the earth. When Acts begins, how many followers of Jesus Christ are there? A few dozen. That's all. If you look at verse 15, we see 120 in all. Just a handful of fearful men and women. But where does the book of Acts end? In Rome, in the center of the ancient world, in the center of opposition to the Christian faith. Paul, the apostle, is there imprisoned. But in the very last verse in the book of Acts, in Acts 28, verse 31, we are told that in Rome, though he was in prison, Paul was proclaiming the kingdom of God and teaching about the Lord Jesus Christ with all boldness and without hindrance. Indeed, the last two words in the Greek text, the last two words in the entire book are the words for boldness and unhindered. That's what Jesus said would happen here in verse 8. You will be my witnesses to the end of the earth. My friends, we are a spirit-empowered church. We read the words of Jesus. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. It's by the power of the Spirit that the church accomplishes all these things. And the question arises, but aren't we only talking about the apostles? Isn't that isn't what Jesus says in verse 8 limited to that special group of men alone? Well, in a sense, what Jesus says does, has to do with the apostles, with the mission he gave them to take the gospel wherever they went and to enlarge their thinking so they understood that the good news of Jesus Christ is not just for people exactly like them. But part of the scope is far wider than just what the apostles themselves did. It's about mission and evangelism and the, march of the marching orders of the church to be Jesus' witnesses. The Great Commission is ongoing. It didn't end with the death of John, the last apostle to die. This is the work that Jesus has given to the church, which does this work empowered by the Holy Spirit. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. It was that power that enabled Peter, the denier, to stand up before thousands of Jews at Pentecost and, and pierce their hearts with the gospel. They hadn't come to Jerusalem for Pentecost to be converted, but they were nevertheless converted because Peter's words came with Holy Spirit power. It's the power to turn stone hearts to flesh hearts. It's the power to unstop blocked ears and, and give sight to blind eyes. We need to think bigger than we do. For the Holy Spirit is still at work. Yes, I know, evangelism, evangelism is hard. Mission is hard. When Jesus said, you will be my witnesses, that word witness in Greek gives us our English word martyr. There's suffering that goes hand in hand with mission. There is a cost. It's not supposed to be easy or without pain. 
but Jesus Christ has given our marching orders, and we must be about his mission wherever it may take us. For most of us, it's just going to be in our own town, in our own neighborhood. But we have to be about this because this is what our Lord has called us to do. One of the things I appreciate in verse 8 is that there are several concentric circles. There, there's Jerusalem. Jerusalem for us, Schwakertown, Perkesee, Pennsburg, places that are nearby with people who are, for the most part, like us. We as a church are to be about the gospel in those places. Yes, but that's just the start. What about Judea? Judea for the apostles was pretty much like Jerusalem, just a little farther away. And, and we can envision our own Judea. Maybe it's Allentown, maybe it's Philadelphia. It's not that much farther. But then they're to go to Samaria, and this is where it gets fascinating. Now we're talking about people who are not like the apostles, people who are despised because they are different. And Jesus is saying to them, you need to go to Samaria. Could it be people that you don't like to have even any dealings with? What about us, even here in Quakertown? It's tempting to fill a church like ours with people who are exactly like us. That's safe. It's easy. But we're called to the Samarias of our world. And the final circle is the, the end of the earth. That is, people who are far away and aren't like us at all. The gospel is also for them. And it's been that way in God's heart and mind all along. But the Jews ignored that part of it. Listen to Isaiah 49, verse 6, God speaking. It is too light a thing that you should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to bring back the preserved of Israel. I will make you a light for the nations that my salvation may reach to the end of the earth. Now, hear that? To the end of the earth. Isaiah 49 is repeated in Jesus' words of mission in Acts 1.8. And so someone like Kevin DeYoung, a pastor who's now down in North Carolina, can say, whatever plans and hopes and dreams you have for the gospel, it's possible that those plans for the gospel are too self-centered. It's possible that they're too naive, but it is not possible that they are too big to the ends of the earth. Fact. Jesus has empowered his church through the gift of the Holy Spirit, and we are to be at the work that he has given us, bearing witness to Christ, preparing others to be sent out so that they may speak to the glory and majesty and mercy and the gospel of Jesus, the Savior of sinners. Fact number two, Jesus has ascended into glory and is in a position of power interceding for his people. Look with me at verse 9. And when he had said these things, as they were looking on, he was lifted up, and a cloud took him out of their sight. This is the ascension of Jesus Christ to glory. He came from glory. He returns to glory. Where is our Lord now? He is at the Father's right hand. The right hand is the position of power and authority. And what this reveals to us is that Jesus left victoriously. He didn't leave his mission unfinished. He didn't leave it incomplete. He rose from the dead, and then our Lord graciously provided 40 days of preparation for his departure. And now we see his final farewell. The apostles saw him go. Look how many times Luke refers to the actual act of seeing. They were looking on. A cloud takes him out of their sight while they were gazing into heaven. Even how they're addressed, behold, this is real. The ascension is factual. Have you ever wondered why Jesus chose to depart in this way? Why didn't he just stop showing up? Why does Jesus choose such a dramatic display? Of course there's a purpose for this, a couple of purposes at least. For one thing, there is a finality to this. Jesus rises into the sky, and as the apostles watch, he disappears from their sight as if to say, you will no longer see me. You shouldn't expect me to return until the end of the age, which, might I say, I've already told you about. 
So by departing in this way, Jesus is indicating that they should get to work. Get about the mission that he has given them. And that is exactly what happened. A second purpose is found in a detail that Luke gives us here, that a cloud took him out of their sight. Clouds throughout scripture are a symbol of God's presence. And that's probably running through their minds because they've seen this picture before. Remember the transfiguration? On that day, Jesus' clothes became white as light and his face shone like the sun. He appeared on that day with two men, as he does here in Acts 1. You know, most people think in Acts 1 that these two men are angels, but Luke doesn't usually use the word men when he's talking about angels. He just uses the word angels. So it's just possible that these two men who speak to the apostles here are like the two men at the trans... Who, who are they? Moses and Elijah? Just a thought. At the transfiguration, though, a cloud appeared. And then a voice speaks from that cloud. It says, he says, this is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. They'd heard the voice of God from the cloud. And here Jesus ascends into a cloud. And it's entirely possible that what we see here is is meant to remind us of a picture we're given in Daniel 7 of God, the Ancient of Days, coming with the clouds of heaven and presenting to the Son of Man dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away and his kingdom one that shall not be destroyed. This is Jesus, the Jesus we worship. Jesus, our Savior, our God, and our King. Jesus has ascended to glory at the Father's right hand. He is seated for his atoning work is complete, and yet he's still serving as our intercessor. He's still serving as our advocate. He's still our defender against all of Satan's accusations. No accusation made against us shall stand, not because of who we are or anything we've done, but because of who Jesus is and what Jesus has done. This is a fact, and it should be a fact that we trust as we live for him, and as we, as the church, bear witness to Jesus Christ. Fact number three, Jesus will return from glory just as he went into glory. Verse 11, as the apostles continue to gaze into the sky, they hear these words from two men in white. Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? This Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. It's as if they're saying, as you get to work, as you do the work that Jesus has assigned to you, know that he's going to return. Be mindful of that and be diligent. My friends, Jesus is going to return. We don't know when and we're not to spend time wondering when, but his return is a fact. He went away into a cloud. He will return from a cloud. May that be our hope and our comfort as we focus on what he has given us to do. You know what this is? What we're seeing here is the ultimate victory cry. We need not wonder whether what we do for Jesus and the gospel is worth it. The calendar of redemption is almost complete. The only thing left on the calendar before it concludes and the kingdom is realized in all its fullness is the return of Jesus Christ. The mission will be accomplished. And Jesus has prepared us. He has prepared you and me. He has prepared us by giving us of his Holy Spirit to empower us. And he is coming back. We need not wonder, so let's get to work. I know it's easy to be timid and afraid. The mission of bearing witness to the gospel isn't easy. Do you think it was easy for these first apostles? They were so few at the start, just 120 of them. They were so timid, even after the resurrection, locked behind closed doors out of fear. But Jesus didn't send them out on their own. He gave them of his spirit. 
He gave them the power that the Spirit provides, the power to preach, the power to proclaim, the power to bear witness. And we have the same Spirit. May we, the church, know that our mission will succeed. And may we go about our mission the way the book of Acts ends, testifying to Jesus with all boldness and without hindrance. May we be like William Carey. They kept telling William Carey, don't bother. If God wants to save the elect, he himself will do it. But William Carey had a burden to go to the end of the earth. And so he forms a missionary society. And at that first meeting of that inaugural society, 1792, he says this, attempt great things for God, expect great things from God. Let's pray. Father God, remind us who you are. Remind us all that you've given us. Remind us of all that we have to look forward to. And then empower us. Give us courage. Help us not to be locked in the walls of the church, behind the doors of the building, but to just simply be who we are as your eyewitnesses, as your ambassadors just basically proclaiming, testifying to the grace of God that saved a sinner like me, like you. Lord, we thank you, Heavenly Father, for your grace. We thank you for this gift that you've given us. And we thank you for the mission to which you have called us. Help us to be faithful to it. And we know that we need not worry whether it will fail or succeed. It will succeed, for you have promised. Lord, we ask this and ask your help for each and every day that we are on mission. We don't have to go far. Some of us might. And Lord, I do pray that within this church, you would be preparing some of our people, some are, whether young or old, for going even to the end of the earth. But for most of us, our mission field might be right here in Quakertown, and quite a mission field it is. But we do not go alone. You have not left us as orphans. Empower us by your spirit to do what you have called us to do and to be. This we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. And now, my brothers and sisters, hear the benediction. And now, whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus giving thanks to God the Father through him. Go in peace.